Thank you for staying with us. Um, we're going to be talking about the evolution of early proteins from amino acids. And our first speaker is Joanna, um, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, is it Maisel? <laughs> Who is joining us remotely from Arizona. Um, she is a professor at the University of Arizona, and she'll be talking to us about long-term evolution of the proteome. Thank you for having me, um, and thank you everyone for who's there for staying until the until the last session. So I have a simple title here, um, and basically, then in the program, what I uh, what we're trying to do is figure out how the proteome evolves, and that way we can project back and ask what the early proteome was like. So this is a, a top-down approach of what we can deduce from modern proteins. And in particular, which amino acids are used and why they're used and sort of questions about, you know, the, whether function drives this or availability drives this. Um, so before, you know, we can really project back, it's like how far back are we projecting? Um, what is the origin of a given protein coding gene that we look at? Uh, and the traditional answer of how people thought about that was that if you look at some gene, then it's diverged uh, from some duplicate of some other gene. But then you need to know where does that other gene come from? Well, it must have diverged after duplicating from some other gene. And so the, the view was one of some big ancient big bang of all genes in the distant past, you know, that, that, that came from some primordial ancestor. And it's the same genes sorting out ever since. Uh, but that is that, that view has recently been overturned. And what we, we now have sort of incontrovertible evidence in favour of is that at some rate, and you can dispute what the rate is, but at some rate there is continuous creation that basically de novo genes um, come out of non-coded or frame-shifting DNA and they have no coding ancestor previously. So this is very different to species that all go back to some sort of LUCA um, Genes all have separate origins throughout the history of life. So what we then do is we can classify, um, a, and a better thing to classify than, than genes turns out to be classify protein domains. Genes are sort of modular assortments of, of different genes, of domains that might have different ages. So we classify each uh, domain in the PFAM database according to when it was born, which we can figure out by when it has homologs. And again, we're focusing on homologs, not orthologs. A lot of people focus on orthologs because they're trying to um, deduce function. Orthologs are the idea that it's somehow the same gene rather than some paralog, which is also related but a different gene. And that's not, that's not an evolutionary rigorous distinction, but whether or not they're related to each other by descent with modification is, so we include all homologs. Um, and then we look at, at trends as a function of how long they've had to evolve. And I originally started out very interested in things like aggregation propensity and intrinsic structural disorder. And I've become a bit disenchanted with that over time because what we found is all the lovely predictors that take sequences and tell you what they do. It turns out that they tell you something almost identical if you take the amino acids and you in, and you feed them in in random order. So the main predictors tend to be the frequencies of each of the 20 amino acids, and most stuff follows from that. And so here's an example of that where we look at the, the frequency of proline um, across all the, the PFAM domains we've looked at, and you can see there's a strong trend in brown among uh, domains that have arisen in animals. Um, it's much flatter in the green in, in domains that arose in plants and relatively flat also among ancient domains of different levels of how ancient. Um, and so if we take the slope of each of these and we plot the 20 slopes for the 20 amino acids and we do this for the three most ancient groups, what we see is there's a correlation with the hypothesized order in which the amino acids were recruited into the genetic code and what their slope is. So what this is saying that the amino acids that were uh, that, that were incorporated into the code first are overrepresented in domains that date back, date back to Luca relative to other old domains. Um, and we think the uh, reason for this is even though the genetic code we're assuming had sort of settled down by Luca, that nevertheless at that point in time, these amino acids remained much more available 
And so they were used more because of that. And some of the other newer amino, amino acids were still somewhat oddities that were less available. And we see the same bias towards using available amino acids um, in plants. It's just it's a different set of amino acids that count as available. In plants, there's a lot of cysteine cellularly because it's produced during uh, sulfur assimilation and it's also produced important against reactive oxygen. Cysteine is very metabolically available and around. Glutamate and aspartate are also very abundant. And those are the three amino acids that we see enriched in younger uh, plant domains, that when new stuff gets invented, it tends to use what's most available. Situation is different in uh, animals, where we find more evidence that function is driving things. So we we estimated um, there was a big experimental evolution done in Dieter Tautz's lab, where random peptides were, were expressed um, in plasmids, and the lineages were competed against each other. And we calculated the marginal effect of having one amino acid versus another. Um, and we found that those marginal effects correlated uh, with, um, uh, with these phyllostratigraphy trends in animals, so that young pro uh, animal proteins tend to be using more harmless amino acids. Um, and we actually see when we have a, another technique where we look at which amino acids are very slightly preferred basically in species that have stronger codon bias compared to species with less stronger codon bias. So species that are able to make finer distinctions and those that aren't, uh, we find that the same uh, amino acids are preferred today in vertebrates as are also preferred in this E. coli experiment. Um, one trend only we found to be consistent across the whole history of life and that is a, a metric if you take the five most hydrophobic amino acids in some proteins, like in the top here, they're very clustered along the, the primary sequence. And in other amino acids, they're very dispersed. And there's a huge trend in this that goes back basically as far as we can reconstruct that um, young genes are random and clustering value of one means it's basically random. And genes that have had a long time to evolve uh, we see this, this more interspersion result where the hydrophobic acid, amino acids are less likely to be near one another. When we see these trends, there are sort of two mechanisms that, that, that we think of of what might be driving them. And I think what most people immediately jump to is, okay, if, if older things have done something, they've had more time to evolve. And the classic process of evolution by descent mid modification, where alleles that are more in one direction take over from alleles that aren't, that this descent with modification drives it and somehow it's just so slow that it's taken all this time. But another hypothesis is that everything was there originally with huge diversity, but some things have been differentially lost. So what we're seeing over longer and longer periods of time is the survivors who are always like that, even when they were born, um, but they're the ones who made the distance. So we're currently trying to figure out which trends are driven by which of these mechanisms. Um, and, you know, this is sort of when we're trying to think what Luca was like, you know, just like we all know, I think that most species that ever lived are now extinct. The same is likely true for Luca's protein domains. Most of them have no contemporary uh, descendants. We only study the ones that have contemporary descendants. And so we use this, this major maximum likelihood technique to attempt to uh, quantify the rate of loss along total loss of, of a PFAM domain across different lineages. And what we find is a nonlinear effect where there is an optimal value. And this is shown here for the clustering metric. And that optimal value with the lowest level of loss does indeed match that that you see in the very oldest PFAMs. And this could help explain, you know, on the same lines, what we see is we see greater variation um, among the younger domains and less variation among the older domains. So, you know, this is really showing so, some evidence that differential loss is driving some of this. So to ask, you know, what was the early proteome like? Well, we're, we're still looking into it, but sort of preliminary conclusions so far is firstly that the contemporary descendants are probably unrepresentative. Um, they've had more time to evolve and they're a highly biased set of, of descendants. 
Um, and so really looking at the field of de novo genes and what things get invented from scratch could be informative and we should consider the likelihood that there was a lot of that kind of thing around back in the ancient proteome and we just no longer see its descendants. Um, and we also have some kind of hints that amino acids that were abundant back then were perhaps a bit more common than now, in particular glycine, alanine and valine. So those are, those are the preliminary conclusions as, as we continue to work on this. Um, so thanks especially to the people in the top row who did, uh, this was a lot of work I compressed into this and also the people in the bottom row for, you know, their contributions and more people who, who aren't even listed here. Um, I tried to put it in, in as tightly as possible. Thank you very much, Joanna. We have a question for you from the audience. Hi, this is Anthony Bernini from Georgia Tech. I saw you were seeing differences in the clustering of hydrophobicity in sequences identified as young and old. Um, could that have anything to do with preferences for different kinds of secondary structure in old versus young domains? Um, we don't think so. So what we think this drives this is the, uh, you know, proteins have to do two things. They have to avoid doing harm. They have to avoid aggregating and misfolding and so on. And they also have to do good. And what we believe is driving this is the avoidance of harm. Interestingly, we weren't the first person to observe this, this anti-clustering, um, but it was previously attributed to all proteins as a means of avoiding harm, as a means of avoiding aggregation, you know, that having too many in a row during the translation process is going to increase the, the, the chance of something going wrong at that point. Uh, what we found is that, the, that it's found, diff, you know, only in old proteins and not in young. I think we have um, a few minutes. So actually, if you don't mind, I want to maybe ask a question, which was um, in a number of your plots, when you have an X axis labeled age of the PFAM in billions of years, I'm just curious, what, what metric do we use to, what's our sort of way of inferring that or guessing that for a given PFAM? Yeah, so the method we're using is to have a big tree of life and to see where the homologs um, are detected. And so in the older, uh, you know, so for some of these uh, younger PFABs, that's relatively good. We, you know, all of the, these all come from time tree and are somewhat consensus estimates of when the, diver you know, based on the divergence of the species level. Um, and then there's a lot more uncertainty, obviously, as you all know, among these older age groups. Uh, but the oldest is basically those who, that have been attributed to being in, in LUCA. Um, the ones up uh, younger among this older ones are ones that are found both in eukaryote, a fairly basal branch of eukaryotes, and also at least plants and animals, because we were doing a plant and animals focused study here. And in between, we have things that are found only, you know, in prokaryotes, but aren't believed to be in LUCA. And what numbers you want to give to these uh, could definitely be open to interpretation. Lovely. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our first uh, presenter. Um, the second presentation will be by Valerio Giacobelli. Um, who is visiting us from uh, the Charles University of Prague of the Czech Republic. He's a postdoctoral uh, fellow in the laboratory of Clara Huchova. Hey, hi everybody. I'm Valerio from Charles University. And I'm really thrilled today to show our recent work. In vitro evolution reveal non-cationic protein RNA interaction mediated by metal ions. So briefly introduction, I think we are how was the composition of prebiotic, prebiotic work? How we already like heavily discussed in this conference, we know that two polymer mostly dominated the scene and was like peptide and RNA. And in some point, so we can argue who was first, the RNA word, peptide word, but what we know that in some point of the evolution, these two, pe pop, uh, these two polymers interact each other. And um, it's important to notice that the composition of the ancient peptide, there are different theory about the composition of the ancient peptide. We know that the, um, as 
already the previous talk described, the composition of uh, the amino acid composition of the peptide was different. So we can uh, probably was much easier alphabet than what we have now. So we can distinguish like two classes of amino acid, like early amino acid and late amino acid. And we can also hear that most, mostly the early amino acid are like the there are no positive charge, but only negative charge and aliphatic one. So how is possible that in prebiotic world, like negative charge molecules can interact each other? Uh, or hypothetical, like how can be this interaction between RNA and ancient peptide? There are two hypothetical uh, like mechanisms. One, it's the most studied in its presence still like in the modern cells. It's like uh, through uh, electrostatic interaction between positive and negative, the positive charge of like um, uh, arginine, lysine, and uh, phosphate backbone. And in the case of prebiotic board, could be possible that not arginine was not present there, but was some non-canonical amino acid that during the evolution just disappear. Or another theory that it's what I'm going to talk today that it's just for the moment hypothetical that this interaction between, uh, between negative charge polymers can be mediated by metal ions, in particular magnesium. Um, how we try to verify this hypothesis? Like, first of all, we select like a template, uh, RNA binding protein, and try and uh, um, create a library where all the late amino acid were substituted with the early amino acid. So we have a protein composed of only early amino acid, and we will try to understand if it's still able to bind the RNA. Uh, so the target we selected was the ribosomal protein, the C-terminal of the ribosomal protein L11 from Geobacillus, uh, Geobacillus uh, stereothermophilus. Uh, we select this target because it was small domain, 80 amino acids, so simple to manage, especially in, from the to manage the library from, from this one. Uh, already a reach of early amino acid, more than 74% was already early amino acid. We know everything about it, it's, it's conserved, we know the crystal structure, and, uh, and we know, we know like the, the RNA target, so uh, the, the target that this protein binds, this RNA uh, binding protein bind. And um, after that, we create like, um, we generate our library, so where every late amino acid will randomize with the, uh, a uh, set of early one, here we can see, and in the end we obtain like a library of the size around 10 to the power of 10 variants. Now with this kind of big library, we have, to select, uh, we have to select the variant and verify if there is something that's able to still bind the RNA. And the method that we selected for, the, for this purpose was the mRNA display. Uh, quickly, the mRNA display is like a technique, a selection method that binds together the genotype and the phenotype through puromycin. So we have like, we can select the function through the protein that it's bind to, the, uh, to its own mRNA. So we can sequence, so once we selected one variant, we can sequencing the sequence uh, by, through mRNA. Uh, here it's described the general pipeline of the method. So we have like the DNA library, we in vitro transcribe and uh, ligate it to the puromycin molecules. And after in cell free, so without cells, so I can just in, the, in, um, in vitro, we uh, translate it, and we obtain the protein libraries linked to the RNA. And after uh, we selected, the, uh, we mobilized the RNA target to, to beat, to a solid support, and we selected the variant. This cycle, this technique, it's repeated for like several rounds. In this case, we perform 60 rounds. And uh, on the right, we can, um, we can see, uh, we're sequencing every round, and we can see the enrichment of every, in every position of the mutagenesis. And we can see, in every position of the library, and we can see that step by step, we selected the, the population was a rigid of like uh, negative charge amino acid. We can see like how the presence of aspartic and glutamine increased during the selection. Till we arrive to the last end when we select one variant, the most abundant in the, in the mix, and, um, and we select this one. It's called like um, E variant. Uh, after that, that we have our variant, we need to prove it. So we express in E. coli, purify it, and verify the binding. Uh, in comparison to the wild type protein. So we have a, a scale, uh, we have like a, a comparison. And uh, we perform different techniques to verify the binding. One of them was the EMSA, the electrophoretic mobility shift AC, where we load on a native gel page gel, like the free RNA and the RNA in potential in the complex. And we can just um, see the shift between these two, um, between the, the complex and the free RNA. And we can observe that the E variant compared to wild type showed the same binding, at least it binds. 
Uh, after that, we were curious to know how is the, com the, the structure, the general structure of the protein uh, in solution, not binding. And we can see that this mutation, the E, e, uh, e variants, uh, lost completely the secondary structure compared to the wild type. That was like most alpha helix. And how we can see the E library, uh, the E variants, uh, show like a, um, a peak around 200 nanometer in the circular decoration technique that show like that it's like highly uh, disordered. Uh, after that, we tried to quantify, give some number about the binding. So we performed the SPR, a surface plasma resonance technique, where we immobilize the, um, the target RNA on a chip and just pass on it like the protein, the two protein, the wild type invariant. And we calculated the association and dissociation binding um, constant. And we can see that the, um, the E variant uh, bind much slower to the target but on the other hand, compared to the wild type, but once the, the, um, the, the protein binds the RNA, uh, it's more stable. The complex is more stable. Uh, the overall KD, that is the ratio between on and off, it's mostly similar to the to wild type, but the difference is mostly in the dissociation. And actually, this is a, it suggests that maybe the evolution, during the evolution, like something so stable on the RNA, it's not so advantaged. If we imagine like a ribosome or wherever, or every mechanism in the cell, it's something dynamic. But here, we have something that once it's bind, it stays there. So maybe the evolution also select this one to, towards something more dynamic. Uh, another a fire characterization was done by uh, pull down technique. So we mobilized the complex on a bit support and changing the parameter like uh, temperature, pH, or the presence of anion, uh, we can destabilize or not the complex. If the complex is destabilized, the protein gets released and we have a signal on Western blot. Uh, we noticed that compared to the wild type, the E variant is much sensitive to temperature and extreme pH. But what was really interesting, it was uh, really interesting was that in the absence of completely ion or metal ions, so in the buffer was just three buffer, uh, the complex was destabilized. But this did happen in the case of the wild type. So it means that this, these ions were involved in somehow in interaction between RNA and protein. Uh, to give Fire suggested, like, uh, proof to this theory. Uh, we perform in collaboration with the Academy of Science of Czech Republic, in Czech Republic, uh, the molecular dynamics simulation. Uh, we use as template the, the crystal structure of the complex of the wild type that it's available, it's a PDB, it's a really well known, and we run for two microseconds. And uh, we compare it, the two structure uh, during the simulation, the wild type and the E variant. And we notice that in the case of the wild type, most of the interaction with the RNA is through uh, hydrogen bond, electrostatic interaction between the arginine, so the negative, the positive charge, and the phosphate bond, like I suspected, it was like known. But, but interesting was that during the simulation of the E variants, uh, the magnesium, magnesium ion were stuck in the structure, in particular in the interface between protein and RNA. And we can see how they form the bond between the glutamic acid the, the, the glutamate, 25, 27, and the phosphate. Suggested that this, this experimental data uh, give it like further proof to this um, experimental data that the metal ion actually helped to the, the interface to bind between the protein and the RNA. So in conclusion, uh, first of all, we demonstrate that an early protein composed of only early amino acid is still able to bind the RNA. And second, for the first time, we give like for the first, exp the first experimental indication that cation ion, like magnesium, can really help the interaction between RNA and protein that can also be possible in the in modern world. Maybe just we didn't look at it, but it's still possible. It's another way of interaction. And third, of all, third, uh, third uh, we can say that a word, a prebiotic word without uh, late amino acid was possible. And probably the, they were inserted inside the evolution uh, because just to help to fine tune the interaction between RNA and protein, uh, just to make everything more dynamic. But anyway, their absence still like, uh, even without them, the, the RNA was still possible to interact with protein. Uh, 
Uh, this work was published on Molecular Biology and Evolution Journal, where we also got the cover. And uh, in this QR code, you can find uh, the paper. If you want to read, there are much more detail, like scientific detail about experiment, about the binding, the structure, and whatever. And uh, I want to really thanks like uh, my colleague, Clara Ukova Groups, and, uh, and all our collaborators and you for your attention. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Valeria. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, it's uh, Jessica Bowman from Georgia Tech. That was a super interesting talk. Um, I'm from the lab at Georgia Virginia with uh, Lauren Williams and Anton Petrov. And we are frequently looking at um, protein and RNA interactions, specifically RNA from the ribosome. Um, one of your conclusions indicated that this is the first known interaction between a protein and ribosomal RNA that's magnesium mediated. Um, if I recall correctly, Chelong Shaw of our group published um, a different interaction between UL2 uh, ribosomal protein um, and the RNA that is magnesium mediated by an AMN um, conserved region in that UL2 protein. Just a comment. <laughs> yeah, actually, we, we, we also working on it. Like it's a parallel pro It's not my project, but our colleague, we are studying about this. And like also, yeah, we noticed that in, uh, especially in the ribosome, the presence of magnesium, it's important to stabilize this. So we can also fit this, this model in, in the recent world, like of the ribosome. So, yeah. Thank and, you. And just one other um, comment. It, and interestingly, in that case, we have a, a later paper also. I think Cha Long Cha was the first author. Um, that demonstrated interactions between an, an, a proposed ancestral ribosomal RNA and some of these um, ancestral peptides or hypothesized ancestral peptides, one of which was UL2. We looked at UL2, UL3, UL4, and what was interesting is that most of those um, interactions were not, uh, magnesium was shown to disrupt the interaction between the protein and the RNA in the case of UL2. So just... We can talk afterwards. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Thank you. Chris Mayer Bacon, um, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Very interesting talk. Uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned that the absence of magnesium uh, or potassium uh, disrupted the uh, RNA, the RNA binding. And you showed uh, MD simulations about the role of magnesium. I'm curious if uh, I'm curious where the role of potassium ions come in in uh, stabilizing the RNA protein interaction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't perform like by myself. Was in collaboration, but I know that like uh, actually the first simulation was through uh, potassium ion actually, and they were like stuck there. And after. Uh, he substitute like the potassium with magnesium, and it like confirmed this data. So also the potassium ion were like present in the in the in the first simulation in the um, in the structure in the interface. All right, interesting. Thank you. All right. I'm afraid we might we need to move on, but we do have some time at the end for extra discussion. So I apologize for that third question there. Thank you. Um, our third presentation is going to be from um, uh, Dr. Pratik Vyas, who is joining us remotely from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Rehovot, Israel. Um, he is a uh, trainee of the late Danny Tafik. Hi, hi, Stephen, and thank you for um, having me. Um, so basically, my research, like the broad goal of my research is to understand how did the first enzymes evolve. And uh, if like enzyme evolution basically uh, relates to recruitment of pre-existing enzymes uh, to perform new function by a series of mutations and selections, this is synonymous to teaching an old dog new tricks, like enzymes being the old dog. But the key question in the field is that how and where did the old dog come about in the first place? Because if you look at the modern day proteins, we know that they are incredibly complex. And yet it tends to reason that in the pre-LUCA world, these complex proteins likely emerged from uh, precursors that were much more simpler 
both in terms of the sequence and the structure. So what were the precursors of these complex proteins? What kind of function did they possess? What kind of structure did they possess? And can we relate the structure and function to their modern day counterparts? These are the questions that I'm trying to address in my, in my work. And specifically, I'm trying to understand experimentally what were the precursors of this family of enzymes known as uh, the P-loop NTPases. So the P-loop NTPases are one of the most diverse and abundant protein families that we know of. These include uh, complex macromolecular machines such as the ATP synthases, preculate recombinases, helicases, and many other proteins that are implicated in essential life processes. And also, P-loop NTPases are one of the most ancient protein families that we know of, and these are unambiguously assigned the last universal common ancestor. So both these attributes make the P-loop NTPases attractive candidates to study protein evolution. So in, in all the P-loop NTPases, the critical element is the Walker A motif or the P-loop motif, which is essentially a glycine-rich loop that is embedded in a beta loop alpha element. And the glycine-rich loop mainly via the G, K, and the T that resides at the tip of the helix, and also by the glycine, it interacts with NTPs, the phosphates of NTPs such as ATP and GTP, and mediates the transfer of the terminal phosphoryl group in reactions such as ATP hydrolysis or ATP synthesis. So this extended beta P-loop alpha motif underlines all the enzymes that belong to the P-loop NTPs family. And structurally, the, the core domain of P-loop NTPases comprises of a three-layered alpha, beta, alpha, sandwich-like architecture. And almost always, the P-loop is a part of the first beta loop and alpha element. So with this background and with this structural information, it brings me back to the question that I'm trying to address, is that what were the precursors of P-loop NTPases? So to answer this question, we need to first understand or we need to first ask, is that what do these precursors actually do? What kind of functions would they possess? So previously, it has been shown by Liam Longo, who is, is, who is also one of the speakers in today's session, is that binding to phosphate-containing ligands was one of the founding functions or one of the ancient functions of not only the P-loop NTPases, but also by also of many other evolutionary ancient families, such as the Rossmans and the Plevatoxins. And in all these ancient families, phosphate binding is realized by a stretch of simple abiotic amino acids such as glycine, serine, and threonine that reside at the N-terminal tip of the helix. And this interaction, this phosphate binding interaction is via uh, bidentate backbone interaction as well as a side chain interaction. So we established or we concluded that phosphate binding function was one of the ancient founding functions of, of P-loop NTPases. And this is what we set to assess if the ancient precursors of P-loop NTPases can bind phosphates. So before that, our, our, our hypothesis was that the, the beta P-loop alpha motif that I just mentioned was one of the, or was rather the, the earliest standalone seed segment, which then underwent self-assembly, duplication, and fusion to give rise to modern-day P-loop NTPAs. And to test this strategy, we use a strategy, uh, to test this hypothesis, we use a strategy where we construct uh, prototypes, which are essentially mimics of ancient P-loop NTPAs. So essentially what we do over here is we take uh, the ancestrally reconstructed copies of the beta P-loop alpha from all the P-loop NTPases and graft it onto a very rudimentary scaffold that mimics the core domain of the P-loop NTPases, that is the three-layered alpha, beta, alpha sandwich architecture, but it does not have any of the other active site residues that modern-day P-loop NTPases have. And then we see if these prototypes, the simple prototypes, can function. So we, interestingly, we did see that the P-loop prototypes are bound to ATP as shown here in an, in an SPR method that was just discussed by the previous speaker. But what was more interesting was that these fragments or these proto proteins also bound single-stranded DNA, as you can see here by higher signal, relative to the double-stranded DNA in an ELISA-based method. So it was it was great that these prototypes bind, bound both NTPs and single-stranded DNA, and I must add that they bind to both these ligands via the same phosphate binding loop. We now wanted to see if we can extend from the realm of just ligand binding and ask if these prototypes or if these protoproteins does have any function which is of greater evolutionary relevance. 
So we asked if these pilot prototypes can remodel nucleic acid, or more specifically, if they can unwind DNA. Given that they bind uh, preferably to single-stranded DNA, can they shift the equilibrium from a double-stranded bound form to a single-stranded bound form? And we were basically guided by the observation that many of the LUCA p loop NTPases were helicases, recombinases, and translocases. And it goes without saying that in the p luca world, composed of nucleic acid and, and proteins, the ability to remodel nucleic acid would have been an important function. Our second guiding observation was that although in most of the contemporary helicases, the phosphate binding loop does not interact with the single stranded DNA, and yet in the PDB, we were able to find certain instances or certain vestiges where we see that the phosphate binding loop does interact with the, the, uh, the, the phosphate backbone of the single stranded DNA, especially in XPD helicases. So given like with both these observations, we then wanted to test if the, uh, the prototypes can unwind DNA. And to test our hypothesis, we used an assay known as the molecular beacon assay, where you have a double-stranded piece of DNA, the top strand of which has a fluorophore and a quencher on opposite ends. And if the DNA strands were to be unwound, it can form a beacon-like structure due to self-complementary ends and resulting in the loss of fluorescence. And indeed, uh, the intact prototype, as soon as you add it to a fluorescing DNA, as you can see here, you see a drop in fluorescence that reaches the baseline in a two hour time scale. And the baseline over here basically represents a completely quenched state. So it was great that the intact prototype uh, mediates DNA unwinding or strand separation. But we wanted to see uh, how small can we go while still retaining the function. So here, by a series of truncation and uh, circular permutation, we narrowed down or to shorten down the intact prototype from 110 amino acid to something which is less than 40 amino acid. And this construct, which we call as the N alpha beta alpha construct, just has an alpha helix and the beta p loop alpha motif. So this N alpha beta alpha construct, not only does it unwind DNA, it is the most efficient at DNA unwinding, as you can see by sharp drop in fluorescence, indicating strand separation by the molecular beacon assay, and it reaches the baseline. So overall, it suggests that the, the basic beta p loop alpha motif demonstrate significant structural plasticity in that you can put it in a variety of reduced complexity, structural complexity scaffold, and it still not only retains the function, but it can also show enhanced activity. And this structural plasticity would have been crucial for primordial peptides to function. So overall, the helicase-like activity that I just showed you provides a plausible solution to the RNA replication problem, which is once the RNA molecules have been replicated and once they have formed a double stranded structure, for them to unwind or for them to open up, it requires an unwinding polypeptide for the second round of replication to occur. And this is where the PLOOP prototypes or uh, protopeptides like the ones which I've shown you would have provided a solution to this problem. Okay, so I mentioned earlier uh, that these fragments bind to NTPs and single stranded DNA, both via the phosphate binding loop. If that is the case, can we have some kind of an exchange between the two ligands? And it turns out it, we can. So what you see over here is the same molecular beacon assay where you see a decrease in fluorescence upon addition of protein. And at this point, when the DNA molecules have been completely unbound, if we add ligands like GTP and ATP, you see that the bound proteins release, allowing the DNA to revert back to its initial unwound state, as you can see by increase in fluorescence. Therefore, resembling some kind of a rudimentary helicase cycle. Whereas modern day helicases, what they do is what they would use the energy of ATP hydrolysis, unwind the DNA and release from the DNA. So we see that these prototypes also have some helicase-like activity or helicase-like cycle. But what was the most interesting part, which I'm going to talk now, is that inorganic polyphosphates, that is long chain polyphosphate, and hexamethophosphate, which is a cyclic form of phosphate, was the most efficient in releasing the proteins from the DNA. As you can see here, this 5.6 micromolar of hexamethophosphate can release almost 50% of the, the proteins bound to the DNA, whereas ATP requires three point, uh, almost 3 millimolar concentration to have the same effect. So that these primordial proteins bind uh, favorably to inorganic polyphosphate, which I have also been proposed to be the ancient precursor of NTPs, we can say that the mode of action of these prototypes is quite tailored to the needs of the primordial world. 
So basically, now you you can you would ask me that how can such a sh uh, short fragment uh, demonstrate such complex functions? And I think and and we know that the key to function is that the ability of these short uh, proteins to oligomerize or to self-assemble. By native mass spec, we have shown that the N alpha beta alpha peptide can form large oligomers of up to 30 Mer complexes. And this is the key for it to function. Otherwise, a short peptide cannot function by itself in a solvent exposed loop. So to summarize, uh, the ancient P loop was a multifunctional P loop, which, did, which had to do multiple functions such as DNA binding, single uh, NTP binding, DNA unwinding. And such multifunctional prototypes then underwent self-assembly, duplication, and fusion to give rise to modern day proteins, which had specialized domains that carry out specialized functions. And to end, I would say that these fragments, these P-loop prototypes, uh, satisfy the basic postulates regarding the emergence of earliest proteins in that they are relatively short. They compose of almost a minimal abiotic amino acid alphabet. These prototypes have a lysine and a histag, but we know that if you remove the histag and even if you mutate the lysine with a glycine, they still retain function and they are incredibly tolerant to mutations. And the last type, the last postulate is that they tend to self-assemble, which allows them to form a larger structural uh, configuration that is crucial for function. So to conclude, I would say that the P-loop prototypes, despite their simplicity, they relate to contemporary P-loop NTPases in terms of their sequence structure and function, and that they serve as uh, starting points or evolutionary starting points for enzymes with more complex activity. And it is only apt that I end the presentation by this quote from Darwin, which was also one of Dani's favorite quotes, is that from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. And I would like to thank the people from my lab. Um, I would like to thank Sarah Fleischman, who is my new supervisor, Stephen and the organize, organizing committee for giving me this opportunity once again, and the Volkswagen Foundation and the Weizmann Institute for the generous funding. And thank you. Thank you, Pratik, for a stimulating talk. And in the interest of time, we're going to suppress questions, but we do have extra time at the end for questions. I'm sure there will be many. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, who is Claudia Alvarez, who is a postdoctoral scholar in the laboratory of um, Lauren Williams at Georgia Tech. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about protein fold evolution or how the structure of proteins changes. So in this work, we wanted to understand the evolutionary mechanisms that led to the diversity of protein folds in contemporary biology. So for example, in a human cell or in a human proteome, there are around 20,000 proteins. And these proteins are made of around 1,000 unique units. So 1,000 is a very small number when compared to the total number of proteins that are present in a single hum human cell. And I think it's also a very small number when you think that these are the product of 3.8 billion years of evolution. But we can see the same question with a different perspective. Um, so the emergence of uh, folding competent sequences is a multi-layer problem. So first, we have the problem of the amino acid sequences being very, there are many combinations. So for the extant genetic code, there are far more possible amino acid sequences than there are stars in the universe. Actually, for a sequence of 100 residues, there are more combinations that are possible th than atoms in the universe. So um, it's, not, it's unlikely that all of these sequences can be sampled. The next problem is that not all combinations will result in a stable fold. And then when you finally find a combination that can fold stably, um, it's not uh, like you can move from fold to fold just by simply modifying um, the sequence step by step. 
So there are not many examples of um, sequences that can transition from one fold to the other, but what we do find is many examples of sequences that share similarity between different folds. The similarity in this case is not overall in the entire sequence, but just a small fragment. These are called cross-fold sequence similarities, and they suggest fold evolution. So once you find these cross-fold sequence similarities, you can assume there's an evolutionary history that is shared, but you still don't understand how these came to be. And we wanted to know the step-by-step -step process of how this happened. So we started looking at examples. We, we thought, do we really know of a case of fold evolution that we completely understand? And it turns out that there is a paradigmatic case that is circular permutation. So circular permutation is a relationship between two proteins or two topologies that have a very similar three-dimensional structure, but the secondary structural elements are rearranged. So how do you get from fold A to fold B? Simply by circularizing the, the fold A, and then you can cleave at whichever point in the protein structure, you will get the circular permutant of the fold A. But this is not what happens in evolution. So there are many examples of circular permutation, but the mechanism is not this. What happens in evolution is that you get one gene that is duplicated in line. So usually a duplication of a domain gives a repeat of the same fold. So you have the same fold twice in a single protein. But when you have circular permutation, this is not what happens. The duplication opens a new folding landscape uh, for this protein, and then a new fold emerges. And this new fold will have some secondary structural elements from the first copy of the repeat, and some secondary elements from the second copy of the repeat. So the last step in the maturation of this circular permutant is the loss of the terminal segment. And that way, you have a daughter fold that is very similar to the ancestral fold, but the secondary structural elements are rearranged. So what do we learn from the study of circular permutation? Well, we learned that if we take many homologs to the first ancestral copy, um, sometimes we will have sequences that are more similar to the end terminus of the daughter fold, and sometimes we will have other sequences that are more similar to the second half of the daughter fold. So if we sample a long enough uh, list of sequences and then we align them, we will get a pattern of cross-fold sequence similarities that will look um, like this. And this is what we want to look for. So now we have a strategy. We know what we want to look for and we can interpret this pattern. Next. Where do we start? And we started by one of the ribosomal proteins, of course. Um, this is universal ribosomal protein 2, and this is very interesting. It, this is a very interesting protein because it's one of the few universal ribosomal proteins that has more than one domain. It's a multi-domain protein. The two domains in UL2 are distinct. These are called SH3 and OV. And these two folds are present everywhere in the translation machinery. So from other ribosomal proteins to amino acyl tRNA synthetases and initiation and elongation factors. So we took UL2, build multiple sequence alignments, search the evolutionary classification of domains for cross-fold sequence similarities, and we were looking for this characteristic pattern. So these are the results of our search for cross-fold sequence similarities. In the orange squares, I'm showing you the region where we would expect to see um, these cross-fold sequence similarities. And you can see that I have divided the results into different panels. Um, so the first one shows the cross-fold sequence similarities between OB and SH3, and the second one between OB and cradle loop barrels. So these folds are uh, in the field of protein fold evolution, like rock stars of the protein fold evolution. 
this has been this have been very well studied and the processes are uh, have been very interesting uh, for this field. Um, so for the first one, SH3 and OB, I am showing you here in color, uh, I have mapped the region of cross-fold sequence similarity into 3D and into 1D uh, representations. So on the left, we have one pair of SH3 and OB that share one region. In this region, we can see that the cross-fold sequence similarity also corresponds to a very similar structure. And then for the pair on the right, the region of cross-fold sequence similarity is also similar in structure, but there is a variation. Um, there's a different turn between them. And now the next thing that we can do, because these two OB folds are homologous, we can align one to the other and then bring their respective SH3 pairs to the alignment. And when we do that, we find the characteristic pattern that is similar to, to the circular permutation case. Now, if we study the case of OB and cradle loop barrel, we have the same. We have one pair on the left that has one region of cross-fold sequence similarity, and then one pair on the right that shows a different region. So we did exactly the same. We aligned these two cradle loop barrels together and then brought the OBs, and this is the pattern that we observe. So what do we think happened? So what we think that uh, can be said about these relationships is that possibly one OV fold ancestor um, duplicated. So usually you would get a repeat of the OV fold, but in this case, the repeat didn't give rise to a repeat of the structure. We got a new fold with new hydrogen bonds and new interactions. So these fold matured and transformed into what we know now as a cradle loop barrel. So in this cradle loop barrel, we have some secondary structural elements and motifs that are very similar to the ancestor and some others that are new. What we can say is that relationships between OB, SH3 and cradle loop barrels illustrate a process that generates new fold topologies from within. And we would say incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one. So here, for example, two SH3s form one OV, two OVs form one cradle loop barrel. So we called this process creative destruction. And this is the idea that once you have one fold, you can create many from that one. So maybe you don't need to create many folds many times. You just need to create one, and then you can generate many. So creative destructions acts on the level of domains, depends on fold plasticity, and resolves cross-fold similarities by a biologically plausible mechanism suggesting that the universe of protein folds is better described as a network than as a tree. So I want to thank everyone in this slide, and we have a preprint for more details. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for a wonderful talk. Can we have a quick question? Hey, Anthony Brunetti here, also from Georgia Tech, and I was uh, wondering, so this, so this work that you showed is looking at these incredibly ancient, incredibly deeply important, uh, really common uh, folds and things. I was wondering, could another way of looking at this be trying to find uh, newer proteins? Because there, there are new proteins being generated, especially in like, giant virus genomes and things like that. And I wonder if, even though those aren't extraordinarily well established or um, extraordinarily well understood, I wonder if that might be a place to see rapid rates of this happening, if this, if this is uh, going on there. Yeah, so this would be a process that can auto-propagate. And this example here um, is actually of a protein that is present in humans. Uh, so this PDB code comes from a sequence that very recently suffered this creative destruction. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us for this session. Um, I'm going to join, I'm going to um, begin by acknowledging the individuals and organizations that have made this research possible. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work of three of my uh, students, two are graduate students, Philip Toe and Haley Moran, and one is a very talented undergraduate, Atarva Bogwat, and we've received support from HFSP, the NIH, and the NSF. So let me start with a question. How do we know which proteins are the most ancient? Well, we can do our best to try to answer this difficult and tangled up question. One way is we can sort of infer that proteins are probably ancient if they're extremely important and if we can infer their presence in some um, primordial organisms such as LUCA. But the problem of this is that, of course, a lot of protein evolution occurred before LUCA, especially of the most fundamental domains, such as the ones that Claudia was speaking about. We can also try to address this question by looking at the phylogeny or the distribution um, by creating the trees. But the problem is that this trees can de expansion events whereby rapid diversification of a certain fold class can decouple the um, distribution and the actual um, order of incorporation into the protein unit universe. So I'll sort of repeat the question, can any experimentally observable property of a protein speak to the antiquity of its provenance? And the, we think the answer to that question is yes, and it's, it's refoldability. So um, my background is as a protein folding biophysicist, and so we think a lot about this remarkable property of proteins whereby they can spontaneously self-assemble into complex three-dimensional architectures. And this is a property that is frequently explored by biophysicists through experiments in which proteins are unfolded either by increasing temperature or adding kaotropes like urea or guanidine, and then um, removing that condition to return to the physiological conditions under which um, some particular proteins have this capacity to return to their native fold unassisted. So we call this property of a protein refoldability. Now, of course, the physical basis by which this is generally explained is by positing this so-called free energy landscape in which we hypothesize that native states reflect um, thermodynamic minima, so that is the confirmation that lowers the Gibbs free energy of the system. And if you um, can posit that, then it's easy to imagine why you could do whatever you want to this protein and it's going to find safe passage back home to its native fold um, because that's basically what thermodynamics says it has to do. But it's worth pointing out that even though this is a property that we frequently study, it's by no means universal. It's basically a property of small single domain proteins, the type that biophysicists like to study. But there are lots of proteins that are extraordinarily important for biology that are complicated, that involve lots of moving parts, that are embedded in mechanisms, and they use all sorts of other machineries like chaperones in order to be able to assemble. So our hypothesis is that by looking at what classes of proteins are capable of refolding themselves autonomously, we're in essence asking a biophysical basis of antiquity because we don't think that during the origin of life, a complex chaperone network or quality control was available. In essence, the only quality control that was available for or 4.2 billion years ago was thermodynamics. And so as a consequence, the intrinsic refoldability of a protein is a bit of a um, way of thinking about which ones were probably easier to access before we have more complex metabolism. In this note, I'll point out that, of course, one property of proteins that makes, makes it very different than RNA is that protein folding has a puzzle-like quality in which there's only really one or small number of possible solutions to minimize the energy, which is very different than RNA, where there are many, many different possible near-degenerate um, combinations that normally also have reasonably low free energy. And this is a consideration that makes RNA generally less refoldable than protein and perhaps something that we should think more about in the context of origins of life. But with that point aside, I want to briefly illustrate an experiment that our team has been developing to try to explore refoldability on the proteome scale. So the way this experiment works is we start with cells, we lyse them using cryogenic pulverization, which retains the vast majority of proteins in their native structure. We divide that sample in half. So to one half, we'll do nothing. We'll call that the native sample. To the other half, we globally unfold the entire proteome using six molar guanidine and then refold it by removing that guanidine with a hundredfold dilution. Now, the key part of this experiment is that we then expose these two samples to pulse proteolysis with this enzyme called proteinase K. 
Now, proteinase K is a protease that has virtually no sequence specificity, so it can cut between any two amino acids, but it does have a very strong preference to cut regions that are more susceptible or solvent exposed. So as a consequence, proteinase K allows us to encode structural information about what the conformational ensemble of the protein looks like into cleavage events. And of course, since we are ultimately a mass spectrometry proteomics lab, what we are very good at doing is sequencing and quantifying tens if not 20,000 different peptides in one sample. So by identifying the um, different peptidic fragments that come from these digests, we can address the question of whether or not a protein was conformationally identical in the refolded sample, in which case you'd expect to get the same pattern of fragments, or for whatever reason, non-refoldable, in which case we would expect novel cleavage sites to appear that were not um, available in the protein when it was in its native folded form. So what do we get when we do this experiment to E. coli? We find that roughly 60% of E. coli proteins are refoldable. Um, whether or not you consider that a lot or a little, sort of a glass half empty, glass half full. The data set that actually I'm gonna be talking more about in this presentation is when we did the same experiment in yeast, which surprisingly actually has a higher refoldability index. And that's something that we think there's a lot of really interesting molecular biology associated with. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm just gonna talk about our yeast data set because the trends in it happen to be be cleaner because there's no, there's very little, if not any, aggregation in these experiments. So what can we say about what types of proteins are good at folding on their own? Well, one thing that we can do that's very, very simple is just divide up these proteins into the number of domains that they have. And one thing that we find very cleanly is that the more domains that a protein has, the harder it is at folding. And this makes a lot of sense because it's long been hypothesized that multi-domain proteins rely more on folding on the ribosome or so-called co-translational folding. And the reason why that is is because when you're folding on the ribosome, the first domain can fold before the second domain has even been formed, and the second domain can fold after the first domain has already folded. So it acts as a convenient way of decoupling the folding of complex objects, which of course is not available when you're doing um, refolding of a completely denatured chain. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can look at these individual domains and classify them into an evolutionary lineage. And to do that, we make use of the ECOD system that you've heard about from Claudia as well as from Liam. This is a way of classifying the protein universe into these highly conserved um, um, uh, fold groups that have a common ancestor. And one thing that we find is that the types of protein, or the types of domains, rather, I should say, that are extraordinarily refoldable have a lot of traits in common. They are generally small, they are generally all alpha or all beta, and um, they are highly represented amongst uh, folds that bind to nucleotides and small peptides. And in that group is both the SH3 fold and the OB fold that Claudia was telling us a lot about. What we find is that the worst refolding in every organism that we've looked at so far is always found amongst folds that are associated with the amino acyl tRNA synthetases as well as tin barrels, with Rossmann's and P-loops not being so far behind. So just to sort of put a picture onto some of these domains, if you're not uh, used to looking at lots of different protein structures, again, I'll sort of reinforce the SH3 and OB are these small albeta folds. The helix turned helix is a small alpha fold. And of course, Tim Barrels and Rossmann's are alpha slash beta folds that tend to be larger, more topologically complex, and have a greater contact order. Another thing that we can do is organize these proteins on the basis of their acidity. What we find is that the worst refolders are mildly acidic. So that means that these are things that have an isoelectric point between five and seven. Very acidic proteins tend to be pretty good refolders, and that I think bodes well for hypotheses about um, the ancient proteins that were, of course, highly acidic and would have had PIs less than five. But we also find that very basic proteins also tend to refold very well. And here our hypothesis is possibly that these are proteins whose folding is chaperoned by RNA. Now, on that topic, we can also look um, closely at the ribosomal proteins. And when we did that, we found a truly shocking discovery. And that is that in both E. coli and in yeast, the large subunit is almost entirely refoldable. In yeast, it's completely refoldable. And I'll remind you that this was not in some preordained biochemical reaction. This was literally refolding entire extracts. So lots of components, very messy. The small subunit, on the other hand, tends to be much less refoldable. And we think that this it, this is an interesting finding that possibly points to the antiquity of the large subunit or at least its function in relation to the small subunit. 
The final result that I'll share with you is that we did the same refolding reaction in Thermos Thermophilus, which is a model thermophile, and we were actually very struck by the finding that actually in contrast to what we hypothesized, proteins from Thermos were miserable refolders. They were much worse than E. coli and yeast. So, why do we think this is? We think that the way that evolution is able to create thermotolerant proteins is maybe not through this classical mechanism of having a very stable protein with a low Gibbs free energy, but rather through a kinetic trapping mechanism whereby the um, barriers to exit the native state become very high, thereby trapping the protein, preventing thermal fluctuations from unfolding it. But by that same token, it means that if you want to refold that protein, protein after it was unfolded, you'd be in trouble because now those barriers are going to act in both directions. So I'll summarize by trying to um, let you know some of our current thinking about how refoldability has affected the way that, at least in our lab, we think about the origins of life. First of all, we think that the best refolders were small, topologically simple proteins that bind peptides and nucleosides, explicitly not the synthetase folds. Now, in some ways, this is maybe almost obvious, you know, once you say it, because synthetases tend to be large, multi-domain proteins. But I think it's worth pointing out that this sort of notion that these represent the most ancient proteins probably represents a ripple from the in implausibly strong RNA world hypothesis in which it has been posited by some that proteins only became important once you could encode them with an RNA template. And of course, in that train of thought, you couldn't even create proteins until you had synthetases. We think the evidence from refoldability is not consistent with that point of view. Secondly, we think that the large subunit predated the small subunit. So we think the early life benefited from a catalyst that could make peptide bonds before you were able to encode that information in a nucleic acid template. And we think that that thinking nicely coheres with the evolutionary and structural analysis that the Williams group has been working on for several decades. We think that one thing that um, kind of struck to us is that tin barrels actually are pretty miserable refolders. And we think that's because these like key metabolic processes co-evolved with translation. So essentially, once you have translation, you can start to create proteins that are addicted to translation in order to be able to fold properly. And so we think that translation and glycolysis and the synthetases by, um, cons by consequence co-evolved together. And finally, we think that it would have been actually relatively difficult to initially evolve proteins in a thermophilic setting because it seems that thermophilic proteins are more reliant on a robust translational apparatus in order to create these kinetically trapped folds. So in essence, if we had seen that thermophilic proteins refold very easily, we might have been able to accept the hypothesis that these were ancient proteins that were more easily able to um, assemble before the advent of translation, but that's not exactly what our results show. I'll put some asterisks there because I think we need to test the hypothesis on more thermophiles first, but that is where our current evidence is taking us. So with that, I want to um, conclude just by acknowledging the extreme um, importance that Dan Toffik has had in shaping the thinking, I think, of a lot of the people in this room, as well as the speakers um, he's dearly missed. And I'm glad that we're able to um, have a number of his uh, trainees and collaborators able to, with, to speak with us today. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but at the end, we will have time. But you'll know where to find me. So our next speaker will be giving a talk uh, remotely. It's Liam Longo. <laughs> Uh, from the uh, Tokyo uh, LC and Tokyo Tech. Uh, we don't have sound. Well, DNA and RNA. I'm going to replay it. Sorry. Hello, the title of my talk today is Through the Looking Glass, Functional Ambidexterity in an Ancient Nucleic Acid Binding Protein. And I'm Liam Longo from ELSI at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And this is a joint project with Norman Matanis at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. <laughs> 
Biopolymers, as we all know, are exquisitely homochiral. Proteins use L amino acids, while DNA and RNA are derived from D ribose. And so, while homochirality is the rule in biology, its origins are actually quite mysterious. I think everyone here would agree that homochirality probably predates the LUCA. The exact point of emergence of homochirality is unclear. And it's also unclear to what extent the emergence of homochirality in RNA was coupled to the emergence of homochirality in protein. And so, although there are some very interesting mechanisms that have been proposed that can result in enantiomeric excess in chemical systems, I think it's safe to say that the question of homochirality in biology is still an open one. The veil between enantiomers is the result of billions of years of biological evolution. And the consequences of this veil were first demonstrated by Milton and Kent. What Milton and Kent did is they inverted the chirality of either HIV protease or its substrate. And they showed that if you use the unnatural couple, so either L and D or D and L, you abolished activity. But if you used the natural couple or its mirror image, you actually had near equivalent activity. And since then, several technologies like mirror image phase display and Spiegelmers have been developed to take advantage of the properties of mirror image molecules. Spiegelmers, for example, are aptamers with high plasma stability and low immunogenicity. And this is because they don't interact strongly with nucleases or nucleic acid binding proteins in the cell. But we wondered, do the same truths hold for the most ancient proteins? Are they also highly sensitive to chiral inversion? To ask this question, we turn to a motif called the helix hairpin helix motif. And Vikram Alva and Andre Lupas have shown that this is one of the most ancient peptides and was at the origin of folded proteins. What we've done previously is we've used a combination of ancestor reconstruction techniques and protein engineering to simplify the sequence of this motif so that we can track its evolution from a relatively unstructured peptide that phase separates with DNA into a folded domain with specific double-strand DNA binding activity. Here is that model in a little bit more detail. A long, long time ago, we had flexible peptides probably with a polybasic sequence composition that formed coacervates with RNA. Over time, those peptides became more complicated and they were able to adopt compact structures. These compact structures, in the case of the helix hairpin helix motif, could potentially dimerize and these dimers could promote the formation of more stable coacervates or phase separated droplets. Eventually, upon duplication and fusion of this motif, we could achieve what is now observed as an independently folding double-strand DNA binding domain. Remarkably, we've been able to track every one of these stages experimentally in the laboratory. And so we recently submitted an article in collaboration with Daniela Goldfarb and Manas Seal, where we characterize the presence of these dimers inside the coacervate. And with this model system in hand, we ask the question, at what stage does chirality matter? Does it matter at the stage of forming coacervates by a simple dimerizing peptide? Or does it matter at the level of an independently folding double-stranded DNA binding domain? We start off by testing whether or not coacervation or phase separation was sensitive to chiral inversion. And so we'd previously shown that the L-peptide coacervates strongly with poly U. When we inverted the chirality of the L-peptide to form the D-peptide, the mirror image peptide, we found that it still formed coacervates with poly U. The differences here are because of the cover slip we're using. Um, it's, not, it's not a fundamental property of the system. Nevertheless, using a nanosite, we were able to see that actually the L-peptide formed slightly more droplets than the D-peptide at identical concentrations. Now, if you'll remember, we previously showed that inside the droplets, there is some folding of our peptide. So we wanted to test whether or not that folding was important for coacervations. 
And to do that, we generated a peptide that had alternating D and L amino acids. Such a peptide is unable to fold, it's unable to form alpha helices. So we tested whether or not this could coacervate, and indeed it could also coacervate. But it did so with a lower propensity than either the D peptide or the L peptide, both of which have the ability to fold. And so we must conclude that coacervation and phase separation is robust to chiral inversion. And this isn't perhaps very surprising because it's already been shown that largely unstructured peptides can phase separate with double-stranded or single-stranded DNA or RNA. This is perhaps because the nature of the interactions that drive phase separation tend to be transient and weak. This is not the case for an independently folding domain binding to double-strand DNA. So how do we expect this domain to withstand chiral inversion? To answer this question, we synthesized the full-length double-strand DNA binding domain in both the mirror image chirality and the natural chirality. And so this is a circular dichroism spectra, which reports on the secondary structure of our domain. We can see that both domains are alpha helical, so they have peaks at about 208 and 222, but that they have an inverted circular dichroism spectrum because they have helices of opposite handedness. Now, using these two proteins, we tested their ability to bind double strand DNA using SPR. And we tested their ability to bind not just the natural DDNA, but we also used LDNA. This makes it so that our experiment has a natural control embedded in it, because we expect that the mirror universe should have similar affinities to our universe. And so as you can see here, both the L protein binding to the DDNA and the D protein binding to the LDNA, they have a similar interaction affinity. Surprisingly, when we looked at L protein binding to LDNA or D protein binding to DDNA, that is the case where only one of the binding partners has an inverted chirality, we still saw significant evidence of binding. And even in the tens of micromolar concentration, we have unambiguous evidence of binding of our protein to the DNA. And we wanted to assess whether or not this was the result of the background binding of the fold itself, and not the result of specific binding to our domain. To do this, we mutated the canonical PGIGP binding loops to five glycines. This is, in a sense, an entropy mutation because it doesn't change the overall charge of the protein. It just makes it so that these loops are more flexible and thus less likely to adopt the correct conformation for binding. When we do this, we observe that the L primordial Rh protein with the five glycines actually binds worse than total chiral inversion of the protein domain. On 29 base pair double stranded DNA, in the natural chiral conformation, we can see that the D mirror protein binds better than the L primordial Rh protein with the 5G mutation. When you look at 101 base pair double stranded DNA, we see the difference is even larger. And this is because in our system, we've observed that the longer the DNA strand, the higher the binding affinity, perhaps due to some cooperativity. It's relatively easy to understand how a single helix hairpin helix motif could bind to double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA, regardless of its chirality. What's harder to understand is how when you have a duplicated domain and these two loops are juxtaposed relative to each other, how they could correctly insert into the minor groove without a significant rearrangement. This is a question that we're currently addressing with MD simulations. But now we have to grapple with the question, which is why would an ancient nucleic acid binding domain be ambidextrous? Why should an ancient domain be able to bind in effectively both chiral forms? And I would like to acknowledge right out of the gate that this could be the result of chance. Some domains are surely ambidextrous just by chance, and that this has nothing to do with the early history of the fold. And so if this was the case, it would predict that as we test more domains for this property of ambidexterity, the ancient domains will have no greater preference for ambidexterity than any other fold. So I want to acknowledge this possibility right at the outset. I think it's a very reasonable one.
I'd also like to lean into the result a bit more. What would it mean if the history of homo chirality was written into the most ancient domains, and if this history was somehow observable by their ability to be ambidextrous? What would that mean? And could that be a relic of a time when amino acid preferences were emerging in a complex community of competing organisms? In the model I've got here, we have an ancient ribosome, a primitive RNA-based translation machine, and it has no preference for either L or D amino acids. The resulting peptide would likely be unstructured, but it would still be able to perform some simple function, kind of like the phase-separating peptide we saw at the beginning of the talk. Over time, however, this primitive RNA-based translation machinery would eventually develop some chiral preference for either D or L amino acids. If a community of these D and L preferring proto-ribosomes existed, along with ribozyme amino acyl tRNA synthetases, any gene that could operate in either chirality would have an advantage in that community. In other words, an ancient preference for ambidextrous protein domains could be the result of a competition between a complex community of early life that had different amino acid preferences, but were sharing genes. And any gene that could have functioned in either chiral form would have had a distinct advantage in this complex community. And it's from this that we came up with the idea of an ancient bet hedging protogene. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank my wonderful collaborators for their hard work. And if this theory sounds too crazy or just crazy enough and you'd like to talk with me, please email me. I'd love to chat. Thank you, Liam. I'm sorry that we won't be able to chat with you more here, but hopefully some of us will do offline or by email. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, final presenter, who is also coming to us remotely from the Charles University of Prague in the Czech Republic. And this is um, uh, Slava Tretichenko. Uh, good evening. Good evening from Israel. Uh, I'm going to present part of the work which I did at Charles University in Prague. And, um, now I'm residing at Weizmann Institute. Uh, so in our lab, we were uh, considering this uh, peculiar disparity just mentioned by Claudia, that uh, with only 100 residue protein, uh, um, we can construct 20 to 100 possible protein sequences, but approximately only 10 to 15 uh, different protein sequences are used by nature. So why is that? And what is hidden in this uh, dark protein space? was exactly what we were interesting, interested in. Uh, so long story short, uh, we made in vitro uh, random libraries. Um, and for doing so, we used two different amino acid alphabet, full alphabet consisting of uh, all 20 amino acid and so-called early alphabet, uh, which uh, used only periodically available amino acids. Uh, so each library was uh, 100 amino acids in length. Uh, consisting of these randomized parts, and uh, we introduced the thrombin um, protease cleavage site into the middle. So the first assay which we tried was the solubility of the library. Uh, so that was assessed simply by expression of our um, randomized billions of uh, sequences in a cell-free expression system and Western blotting. And for solubility, we just spinned the mixture and took supernatant, uh, supernatant to assess the soluble fraction. So uh, upon the expression in three different temperatures, 25, 30, and 37 degrees, uh, we've seen a monotonic increase in expression uh, in early and full uh, amino acid alphabet libraries as expected. But um, the solubility of these two libraries showed that while early alphabet uh, proteins are essentially fully soluble in all temperatures. The full alphabet library is only partially soluble and its solubility remains um, approximately constant uh, within uh, our temperature range. Uh, 
So next, I try to add the chaperone DNA K into the sample mixture. And again, I seen um, no effect in early alphabet library. So supplementation of chaperone did not improve uh, the expression anyhow. But in the full amino acid alphabet, alphabet library, I see small deviation. However, the difference is not large. Uh, the interesting part is that uh, the soluble part of the libraries uh, of chaperone supplemented libraries uh, showed interesting trends that early amino acid alpha library remained soluble as shown uh, before, but the full amino acid alpha library got uh, completely solubilized in the presence of chaperone, which means that chaperone can actually act on uh, proteins without any evolutionary background. So the next assay after our centrifugation solubility assay was the proteolysis assay, which allowed us to separate um, the whole uh, combinatorial library into four parts, the soluble and degradable, degradable, insoluble, degradable, and degradable, which corresponds to the more structured parts of soluble proteins and more um, disordered parts of soluble and insoluble uh, fraction of the library. So um, these are the results. The, this figure is uh, quite complicated and I have no chance to describe all the juicy details which are contained within. But uh, let's consider only the uh, dark blue part of all these um, results of on full, uh, full amino acid alphabet and early amino acid alphabet libraries without and with chaperones. We see that st uh, structured fraction is prevalent in all four conditions. And upon the addition of chaperones, we do not see any uh, induction of the structure. That means that uh, the structure content of protein is uh, um, coded within its primaries. So in conclusion, uh, we think that early alphabet is soluble and chaperone independent, uh, that full alphabet is solubilized by chaperones. We observed similar compacted structure fragments in both libraries. Uh, we've seen that chaperones do not promote the compaction. Uh, we argue that there is a possible structure formation in the prebiotically plausible alphabet libraries. And we show that chaperones do positively interact with the random sequences. So with all of that, I recommend you to look at our paper where we describe many other interesting things uh, on uh, how we made chaperone, how we made the libraries, how the libraries are uh, behaving upon the heat shock, different protease assay and bioinformatic predictions. And with all that, thank you, thank Clara Hlochova, and thank organizers to you of the conference. Lovely, Lovely. thank you, thank you Slava. Slava. Let me turn my computer on mute. So um, let's have maybe a few minutes of discussion with all the speakers. So speakers who are in person um, you can maybe join us on the panel. Those who are online, maybe stay in the room. If you have a question for any of the speakers, please uh, line up behind one of the mics and um, we'll probably spend more time hanging out after this because there's nothing else after it. So. <laughs> Hello there, Shelby Osborne, University of Arkansas Center for Planetary and Space Sciences. This is a question for Dr. Freud. Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, sorry, it's Freed. Yeah, don't Freed? Worry, <laughs> well, I'm from Arkansas, so we just say Freud all the time. So I was just going to ask you, uh, E. coli and yeast have a lot of similar enzymes, and generally we study those in tandem anyways. What would the approach be if you had a protein or a ribonuclease sequence, and you wanted to know what that sequence was like before the modern folding, but you don't know what the original or analogous structure was? Yeah, cool. That's a great question. Um, so the, the trends that we see in E. coli and the trends that we see in yeast are basically the same. So like whatever is more refoldable in E. coli is also more refoldable in yeast. It's just that in any given category, the yeast ortholog is generally more refoldable on average by about 15 to 
And we've recently, I think, come up with a pretty um, convincing explanation for why that is. And it can be basically explained in terms of the fact that yeast proteins are more disordered. So the extra disorder that tends to punctuate between the folded domains in yeast proteins seems to make it easier to refold them off the ribosome because they're sort of less likely to get in each other's way. Whereas the E. coli proteins tend to have very short, if any, disordered linkers at all. And that, in our opinion, or at least our hypothesis is that that destined them to be dependent on translation to fold. And if we didn't know, for example, that E. coli and yeast were correlated, how would we approach the problem of figuring out what the uh, previous structure and enzymes and proteins of yeast would have been if we didn't know that E. coli existed? Oh, you mean like the ancestral sequences, like the precursor? Oh, I see. I mean, we could do, we haven't done it yet, but a, a cool experiment to do would be to do the sort of ancestral reconstruction and ask, you know, how does the property change for proteins that are perceived to be more ancient, but we haven't done that yet. That'd okay, cool interesting. Experiment. And may I get your contact information after the question? Maybe uh, offline, just so some of the other. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, though. Hello, Josh Ariola, UC San Diego. I had a quick question for Valerio. Um, I was wondering if you were able to observe any protective effect on the RNA by the peptide or the protein. Um, protective, like effect, you mean? Like uh, yeah, so yeah. If, if you had like high magnesium and high pH, I was wondering if you could see less RNA cleavage, like self cleavage, when you have the peptide present. Mm, no, we didn't perform this kind of experiment. Uh, we performed like uh, hydrolysis by RNAsis and proteases. And that one, yeah, we perform it. So like removing, uh, actually there's this uh, by RNAsis. So we had like uh, a chelator, ADTA in the, in the media. And uh, we saw that when we added ADTA, the complex get degraded. When instead like the DTA, it's removed from the media, so there is magnesium, the, the complex is stable, the RNAs is not able to degradate. So, and uh, we did the same on the other side, so we use a proteasis, so when the, but this one is without a DTA, so, but the magnesium protect the, 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 the binding from the, um, the cleavage by the proteasis and RNAs in presence of magnesium or not. So, okay. but yeah, it's a good experiment like to, to try also with the, higher concentration and titration. Yeah, cool, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Celso Nwehbe from University of Arizona and I have a question to Stephen Freed. Uh, I know this is a long shot, but I was wondering if there is a software or something uh, that allows you to calculate refoldability as a matrix from the sequence, just like you calculate disorder propensity. I think that's an amazing goal that we would love to be able to do and I think that the, the stage that we're operating at is to try to collect features like biophysical, structural that we can associate with it. And then mm -hmm. I think that ultimately as we sort of get more and more features and map more proteomes, it shouldn't be too crazy to involve some machine learning algorithm to mm -hmm. assimilate it all together. But for that, I will maybe ask for your help because to me, machine learning still mystifies me. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I have two questions, one fairly specific and more general. And the specific one is, is definitely for, uh, I guess, just for Stephen. And the general one mostly, I think, applies to your talk, but could apply to others. So please chime in if it does. So the first one is um, for the ribosome, you said for the ribosome refolding, uh, whatever, the results there. Uh, do I understand that the assay for that was simply you had an, an extract and you you heated it up to to unfold it and refold and then you were using that protease uh, protease assay that you used for the other proteins? It's all was that all the same assay? Yeah. So the basic structure of the assay is you take an entire extract, um, add solid guanidinium chloride to it to unfold everything in it, and then dilute it out in order to um, refold things, and then you compare that to an extract that was never subjected to the original unfolding, but where they're otherwise compositionally identical, it's just simply had different histories. And then the conformation of the proteins is then probed um, with the protease. So when, when we say that the large subunit seems to be refoldable, what we really mean is that um, amongst the 36 uh, 
large ribosomal proteins for which we have data, we can't tell any difference in the proteolysis profile before versus after, okay. but it seems to be quite different for the small subunit. And, and the second more general question is that uh, for, for your assay and for, any, any, for most of these other talks as well, of course, membrane proteins are very important to biology now or probably very important from very early on, perhaps some simple membrane proteins, but they kind of represent a particularly difficult challenge, I think, for some of these assays. So like in your refolding assay, presumably you're not yeah. in a position to look at anything but the soluble proteins. And in the last talk, one of the screens was for solubility and I think maybe sort of implied that that it's important to have that solubility, but in fact, there are probably a lot of early proteins. It's very yeah. important that they not have that property that they, they punch into a membrane. So that's that's the more general question. I think um, certainly anyone who thinks that they might have something relevant, please chime in. But Slava, do you want to comment? Were you able to hear the question? I can to say at least briefly for ours, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Our assay has a blind spot to membrane proteins because we essentially lyse without detergent and then they all come out and then we do all of our refolding on the clarified extract. So in essence, we would love to know more about it, but we can't say much about it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Andrew Wheeler from the University of Arizona. I have a question for Stephen Fried. So when you're looking at these domains that have different abilities to refold, uh, you mentioned acidity and the, the complexity of these domains, but um, did you also look at any other sort of features of the sequence for considering what might be driving those differences and how well they can refold? Can you maybe repeat that with your mask tip down? <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, when you're looking at these different domains with different abilities to refold, you can, talked about acidity and the complexity of them, but have you considered any other features of these sequences that might be driving their ability to refold? So at a very gross level, the sequence will be reflected in those sort of um, ECOD fold groups just because as sort of Claudia spoke very elegantly about the we can sort of use hidden Markov models in order to group proteins together to these sort of lineages that will, of course, have some sequence conservation. So in that sense, when we say that OB folds always refold, we are saying something about that, you know, sort of neighborhood of sequence compositions that have that property. But in terms of like whether or not like kind of like a bag of letters type of, you know, analysis of other certain amino acids that correlates, we haven't done that. That would be a good thing to do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason Greenwald from ETH Zurich. Uh, so I have to first preface this with saying I'm a bit biased because I'm very much in favor of not in any like, so I, I really believe it's true, but it's what I study is uh, amyloid peptide aggregation in the origin of life. And so I have this thoughts that perhaps early proteins came out of uh, amyloid structures and took, um, I think it was Joanna, who was making comments about um, stretches of hydrophobic residues being selected against. Or I, I'm not even sure I, I remember the detail now, but I just want to point out that there are studies, and one I remember is uh, from Kauflisch, saying that organism complexity anti-correlates with the beta aggregation propensity of the proteome. So that being that the more simple organisms, in principle, the older ones uh, perhaps had more propensity in their proteins that be, to have beta aggregation. That sort of fits with my, not my theory, but a theory of early proteins coming from beta structured aggregates. But also it, it relates to your work, Stephen, I think, that saying that if refoldability, which I think is a super cool idea as a potential um, marker of how old a peptide is, a protein is, um, it might also be that there's uh, some part of the refoldability that doesn't necessarily show up in your assay because it's aggregation. Um, that's so sorry, that was more like blabbing than a, a question. Um, so I'll make one question then and someone else can talk if they want to. Um, uh, Valerio, yeah. You talked about, uh, that super cool talk by the way, I really like that kind of work uh, where you're replacing, trying to make primitive looking uh, protein see. Um, but you showed that the fold was different, I think, by at least CD, right? So you had something that wasn't folded, but then you tried to model it folded. Is, did I miss something, or is that sort of a little bit out of sync with what you expect, or do you think it may have uh, retained some of the same fold? No, actually, we were 
was kind of we kind of expected that the the yeah mostly the the the, the variance got like almost 30 percent of difference and we kind of expected that he was supposed to lose the function the the structure so and um uh, yeah so it was kind of plausible like and also like uh it's, it's typical of like this prebiotic protein of like uh, like small this alpha, early alphabet. I was also Slava uh, show before. They tend to be more disordered, so it kind of fit with our uh, like with our theory that it's not not did no surprise to us. Like, thanks. I know everyone wants to go home, but um, just one quick question for Cloud. Sorry, I get the names right here. Claudia, right? Uh, you, you talked about the order. I, I like that concept too of uh, how pep proteins are evolving their structures but can you tell the direction it's going i i, I i'm the geometry kind of lost me there can you say it's going from sh3 to cradle not reverse yeah with these patterns we can have some idea of the which one is the ancestral fold and which one is the daughter fold but not all the time so in circular permutation it's hard you need other information I think we're a little bit overdue, so please join me in thanking all of our speakers. And hopefully there's a chance to chat more before you all uh, head home. So this was a fun conference. <laughs>